This video will cover the following objective. Identify and describe the major anatomical areas of the heart, chambers, valves, and greater vessels. This illustration shows an anterior view of the heart. Blood flows through veins into the superior chambers of the heart called the atria. We'll start by focusing in here on the right atrium. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood, blood that has a low oxygen concentration that is coming from the systemic circuit. So this blood has delivered oxygen to cells and tissues all throughout the body. And this blood drains through the veins into the right atrium. And so the inferior vena cava is draining deoxygenated blood from the lower regions of the body. So the lower limbs as well as the abdominal pelvic cavity are draining blood in through the inferior vena cava, whereas the upper regions of the body, the head and the upper limbs are draining blood in through the superior vena cava. Blood also drains from the coronary circuit, the, the blood vessels that are supplying blood to the muscle of the heart wall are the coronary blood vessels. There are coronary arteries that deliver the oxygen rich blood to the heart muscle. And then cardiac veins drain that blood. So the cardiac veins like this great cardiac vein or this small cardiac vein will also drain blood into the right atrium. They will join together. So the cardiac veins drain into one large cardiac vein known as the coronary sinus. And then the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. Blood from the right atrium then moves down into the right ventricle. So the right ventricle receives the deoxygenated blood from the right atrium. And then it pumps this blood out into the artery known as the pulmonary trunk. So the pulmonary trunk then branches into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery is carrying this blood to the left lung, whereas the right pulmonary artery carries this blood to the right lung. Then inside of the lungs, there are small blood vessels known as the pulmonary capillaries where gas exchange occurs. Oxygen will diffuse into the gas at the pulmonary capillaries. Then the blood from the pulmonary capillaries is oxygenated blood. So notice I switched from the blue ink to the red ink to represent oxygenated blood. We commonly illustrate deoxygenated blood in blue and oxygenated blood in red. So this oxygenated blood is coming from the lungs and it's going to flow into the left atrium. It will flow into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. So we can see here the left pulmonary veins are draining the blood coming from the left lung and the right pulmonary veins are draining the blood coming from the right lung. But both the left and the right pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium and then left atrium pumps this blood down 
into the left ventricle. Then the left ventricle pumps blood out into the aorta. And so here we can see the ascending aorta as part of this large artery, the largest artery of the systemic circuit, the aorta distributes this oxygenated rich blood to smaller arteries that branch all throughout the body. This illustration shows us a posterior view of the heart. We can see the blood vessels are attached here at the superior region. This is the base of the heart and down here, this pointed region, the apex of the heart is pointing off inferiorly and to the left side. Now with the posterior view, we can see the coronary sinus, which drains the deoxygenated blood from the coronary circuit back into the right atrium. So the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava, and the coronary sinus are the veins that return deoxygenated blood to the right atrium blood flows from the right atrium down into the right ventricle and then from the right ventricle out into the pulmonary trunk that branches into the right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery carrying the deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it becomes oxygenated then this oxygen rich blood flows back from the lungs through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium and the left atrium then pumps the blood down into the left ventricle and blood flows from the left ventricle out into the aorta. So the aorta is a large elastic artery that can stretch as it receives high pressure blood coming from the left ventricle. And then the aorta will branch to numerous smaller blood vessels that distribute oxygen rich blood throughout the body. So some more details of the surface anatomy of the heart that we can see in this illustration are the, the auricles of the atria. So the auricle of the left atrium is shown here. The, the auricle is a flap-like outer portion of the atria that allows the atria to expand in order to hold more blood. So there's a little flap-like exterior portion of each atrium that slightly resembles the external ear, the auricle or pinna of the external ear. And that's where this name came from. This, this flap shape here looks a little bit like the ear. And similarly on the left side, this flap shape resembles the external ear. And so it's called the oracle of the atrium. So another thing we can see on the surface anatomy is the adipose tissue as well as the large arteries and veins are found within these grooves on the surface. And so the grooves on the surface of the heart are known as the, are, they're called a sulcus. So this is a, a sulcus on the surface of the heart. And this sulcus is on the posterior in between the left and right ventricles. So we call this the posterior interventricular sulcus. There's also an anterior interventricular sulcus and then a coronary sulcus. So the coronary sulcus is where we see the coronary sinus is located. So this groove that's running in between the atria and the ventricles that contains the coronary sinus is called the coronary sulcus.
And because it is separating the atria from the ventricles, it is also sometimes referred to as the atrioventricular groove or atrioventricular sulcus. So the coronary sulcus or atrioventricular sulcus are synonyms and they contain the large cardiac vein known as the coronary sinus. And the coronary sinus functions to drain deoxygenated blood coming back from the heart into the right atrium of the heart. There is a groove on the anterior of the heart here located in between the left and right ventricles. This groove is known as the anterior interventricular sulcus. So the anterior interventricular sulcus is a groove on the anterior of the heart in between the left and the right ventricles, and it contains the great cardiac vein, as well as the anterior interventricular artery. Another structure from the surface anatomy I wanted to point out on the anterior view here is the ligamentum arteriosum. So ligamentum arteriosum is connecting between the pulmonary trunk and the arch of the aorta. And this is a remnant from a structure known as the ductus arteriosus. In the fetal circulation, the ductus arteriosus was a, a blood vessel or a, a shunt, a, a vascular shunt, a blood vessel that allowed blood to bypass the pulmonary circuit. And so in the fetal circulation, the lungs are not functioning for gas exchange. And the Ductus arteriosus would allow blood to be shunted from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta to bypass the lungs and go directly into the systemic circuit to travel to tissues throughout the body. Here we see a view of the internal anatomy of the heart on this illustration from Gray's Anatomy. And we can see there are muscular ridges on the inner surface of the heart. Within the atria, these muscular ridges are called pectinate muscles. And so I'll highlight the pectinate muscles in yellow to make those stand out. These are these muscular ridges of the walls of the atria. And so we can only see the pectinate muscles of the right atrium at the moment, but there's also pectinate muscles that are muscular ridges in the inner surface of the left atrium. Now there's also muscular ridges on the inner surface of the ventricles. Some of these ridges are called trabeculi carnii, and there are others that are called papillary muscles. So I will use the green color here to highlight the trabeculi carnii. So these muscular ridges in here, these muscular ridges within the ventricles, and you can see they're sort of branching and irregularly arranged. And all throughout the wall of the ventricle, there are these trabeculi. Carnii. So the trabeculi refers to the irregularly arranged strut shape of these ridges. And carnii refers to meat. Um, and so these are muscular ridges, irregularly arranged muscular ridges, the inner surface of the ventricles called trabeculi carnii. Now there are also ridges known as papillary muscles that are found in the ventricles. And so the papillary muscles 
look somewhat similar to the trabeculae carnii. However, they're attached to heart valves. So I'm highlighting papillary muscles with the purple color now. And so these papillary muscles, they connect through tendinous cords. We call the cordy tendony. So the, these cordy are what are, will distinguish the papillary muscles from the trabeculae carnii. So cordae, tendine, are these tendon-like cords that are attaching from the papillary muscles to valves in the heart known as AV valves or atrioventricular valves. So the atrioventricular valves function to prevent blood from flowing backwards from the ventricles into the atria. So I'm highlighting the AV valves now in purple. So AV valves, AV stands for atrioventricular, and there's two AV valves. The right AV valve is the tricuspid valve, which prevents blood from flowing backward from the right ventricle into the right atrium. Whereas the left AV valve is labeled bicuspid valve in this illustration. However, the, there's another name for the bicuspid valve. This is commonly referred to as the mitral valve. So a, a mitre is the type of hat that the bishops and popes wear, the pointed hat. So that's where this name came from, the mitral valve that has two flaps or cusps has the appearance of the mitre, the, the hat, which uh, is worn by the Pope. And so it, that's where its name comes from. The mitral valve, also known as the bicuspid valve, is the left AV valve that prevents blood from flowing backwards from the left ventricle into the left atrium. So when the ventricles contract, the pressure of blood inside of the ventricles forces the AV valves closed and blood is forced out of the ventricles into the arteries. There are also valves that prevent blood from flowing backwards into the ventricles from the arteries when the ventricles relax. These are what we call the semilunar valves. So semilunar valves, we commonly just abbreviate SL. So SL valve for semilunar valves. Here's the aortic semilunar valve. So the aortic semilunar valve functions to prevent blood from flowing backward out of the aorta into the left ventricle. As the left ventricle relaxes and there's a lower pressure in the left ventricle than there is in the aorta, the blood in the aorta pushes back on the flaps of the aortic valve, causing the, those flaps to be pushed closed. Those flaps have a crescent shape like the moon. So semilunar comes from that shape of the crescent, similar to the shape of the moon. And there's three of those crescent shaped flaps that push closed in order to prevent backward flow from the aorta into the left ventricle. Similarly, there's a pulmonary semilunar valve to prevent backward flow from 
the pulmonary trunk into the right ventricle, but we cannot see the pulmonary semilunar valve in this view. With this illustration of the internal structures of the heart, we can see the pulmonary semilunar valve. This pulmonary semilunar valve functions to prevent blood from flowing backwards out of the pulmonary trunk into the right ventricle. Another structure we can see here is the interventricular septum. So the interventricular septum is this muscular wall separating the right and the left ventricles. Another structure we see here is fossa ovalis. Fossa ovalis literally means oval shaped depression in the surface of the right atrium. So this is an, an oval shaped indentation in the right atrium, but it's a remnant from a structure known as the foramen ovale. And foramen ovale is a structure present in the fetal heart that allows blood to flow to, directly from the right atrium into the left atrium. This is important in the fetal circulation because the fetal heart is bypassing the pulmonary circuit, shunting blood directly into the systemic circuit as the lungs in the fetal body don't function to support gas exchange. There's no need to send large amounts of blood through the pulmonary circuit and the foramen ovale would allow this blood to bypass from the right atrium directly into the left atrium. Normally, the foramen ovale seals at birth to become the fossa ovalis, although it is possible to have a patent foramen ovale, a foramen ovale that is allowing blood to move from the right atrium into the left atrium after birth will make the heart pump less efficiently and can increase the risk for blood clotting. Here we have an internal view, a picture of the internal structures of the heart, where we can see the papillary muscles and the trabeculae carnii, the ridges of the muscular surface in the ventricles. While they have a superficially similar appearance, we can see that the papillary muscles are a little bit more prominent and also attached to the cordy tendony, the tendinous cords that are connecting the AV valves to the papillary muscles. When the ventricle contracts, the papillary muscle is also stimulated to contract, placing tension on the cordy tendony, which helps to reinforce the AV valve, preventing regurgitation, preventing the valve from being forced backwards and preventing blood from being able to move from the ventricle into the atrium. 